Okay, so question number one. How can we keep students work safe in a public domain? Um, so we were just talking about trying to keep our students safe. Um, not allowing other people to maybe find out the kids names, um, find out where they live. So basically, <clears throat> we just want to know how can we post their things on the blog, but keep them safe from other people in the public. Hey there. So the question of students safety, students privacy is definitely one that's incredibly important. And it's also increasingly um, a little bit of a challenge to get around because there's more and more laws and regulations at the state level, potentially at the federal level, but also every school and district can also have their own own policies in place that we must make sure that we follow. But in general, there are some things that we can do. Um, so the, the first, the biggest piece of advice that I would give, in, in, in my opinion, especially um, maybe elementary grades, middle grades, and even in high school, but you could argue in high school it doesn't have to be this way, but is to block search engines from wherever the students are publishing. So in a WordPress site, a blog site, edgy blogs, all of these different tools, one of the options is to block search engines. So you're not making the site completely private, so the student can share the link with their family, with their peers, with their teacher, um, and, and they can do so easily just by sharing the URL, but their work isn't going to show up in Google or other search engines, so it's going to be much harder for people to find. They'll have to know the specific link. Um, so it's kind of like the option in Google Docs where you can um, leave it private except for those that know the, the link. And that, that's really my favorite way to kind of mitigate a ton of potential problems. We just block search engines and, and, and keep it out of there, and, that, and that's a really good way to go. So beyond that, it, a lot of it comes down to basically training um, the students, explaining the expectations that you have with students and and modeling what that behavior would look like. So things like talking with your students before they're publishing about what are appropriate things for them to be sharing. Should they be sharing their full name? Should they stick to just first names only? Um, should they stick to just initials? You know, all of these things will depend upon where you are and what policies that, that you have in place. A good rule of thumb is basically to stick to first names only. Um, also talk about things like don't share your address, don't share your phone number, your email address. Um, you know, very personal details that could help someone identify you, where you are, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the whole idea of photos as well, images, you know, it, ask permission from parents if it's okay for the students to be publishing photos of themselves, um, if, if it includes their faces especially. Um, and with that, a, a, good, a good tip would be to have students create an avatar uh, that they could use for, for their photo, basically by their name on, on the blog post or whatever it is that they're writing when they're leaving comments so that they'll have a depiction of them that may not be their actual photo. Uh, which is pretty popular with students. And so that's, that's really the big keys with, with keeping students safe. Again, sharing the expectations up front, modeling that behavior with them, and then making sure that you're monitoring as they're publishing. And I'm not suggesting that you moderate and approve all content before it goes live. I don't think that's really a sustainable way of going about it. Um, some teachers definitely do that, and, and that's good if, if, if they're like that. Um, but just making sure that you're on top of, of keeping track of what students are publishing and when, and it's going to just will avoid just about all the problems out there. Thanks, Ronnie, for sharing that information. I really appreciate, especially um, blocking search engines. I hadn't even thought of that, but I can see that that would be something I would need to do. Thanks. 
Thank you for the suggestions, Ronnie. I especially like the idea of um, suggesting to the students that they only use uh, their first name and to be really careful about sharing addresses and email addresses. Through Gmail, the school does have email addresses for all the students, which is basically their student ID number, so it doesn't have any part of their name in it at all. Hello, Ronnie. Um, thanks for those ideas. I especially like the idea about um, having the kids make an avatar. I could see them having fun with that, and, and it's a great idea not, so not to have their actual picture, but, you know, something that they might like or want to be or something like that. So that was a great idea. Um, the next thing, uh, a question I have is... Um, so who, who would I ask about maybe my policies? Would I go to my principal or would there be somebody else that I might um, go to to ask about uh, creating a blog and, and my ability to, to have one at the school so that um, parents can go and see the type of work that their students um, are doing in, in my class? So question number two is, can you summarize the restrictions on student identity and data in the digital world? Um, I think all of us are very interested in getting our students online and starting blogs or digital portfolios, um, but we also want to make sure that our students are being safe and that we're um, doing it in the right way. Um, so I guess what we're really wondering is, what laws are in place about um, what students can and can't post, um, what permissions do we need to allow students to be online blogging or um, creating digital portfolios, is that up to our school districts, is it up to the parents, or are there laws set in place um, detailing exactly what it is that um, our students are allowed to be putting online. Well, in general, there's not to my knowledge any state or even federal rules of any countries that I know of that dictate exactly what students can and can't publish themselves online um, when it comes to using, you know, doing it for school or for an educational purpose. That being said, many schools, many school districts, they will put some guidelines in place, some policies in place that say, you need to get permission for certain things like publishing photos or student work and that sort of thing. And it is always a good idea just at the beginning of a course or at the beginning of a project, whenever you're going to be blogging with students or having students publish or share online, publishing videos to YouTube or whatever it is, just to send a note home, uh, an email or, or, or whatever works best for communicating with your parents just saying, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, you know, here's the, um, the outcome that we expect, you know, please let me know if you have any questions. In general, you don't have to get, like, explicit, um, you know, signatures back or whatever, but you're showing due diligence that you're involving the parents, just making sure that everyone's okay with it. Now, your school might have a different policy that says you need to get a signature, um, verbal approval or whatever it is for every single thing that you do. And if that's the case, then you definitely want to follow that. Um, but just always best keep your parents informed and, and listen to, to what they want. If, if, if they don't want certain data published then or certain projects published, then we just come up with an alternative, making it private or whatever it may be. Um, but if we can share with them the reasons behind what we're doing. And also, one of those reasons often is uh, publishing online or just publishing students is sometimes the law, basically the standards. Um, in Texas here where I live, we have the TEKS. Uh, you know, lots of states use Common Core. There are standards in Common Core and TEKS and different standards around that suggest that students should be publishing um, for authentic audiences or in different media. And so that could include on the web. And so, you know, you're following the the standards that are provided for you. Now, those standards aren't usually assessed. There's no, you know, state assessment for if, if they're meeting this standard. So people don't 
often know about them, but they, they exist and encourage to see if, uh, encourage you to see if, if perhaps in your courses it is a requirement. And then that's just one more thing to provide to parents or administrators, whoever it is that's questioning your use there. Ronnie, your comments have really made me reflect on my school policies right now. Um, I'm at a high school, so currently um, as the um, students enroll coming in as freshmen or sometimes as transfer students, they sign a contract regarding having their photograph or their picture online, but more it's on the part of the school using on, the, on a school website or other media. Um, images of the student or work of the student. Currently, we don't have anything um, letting the parents know that students may be publishing their own work online to blogs and etc. So really made me stop and think about current policies of the high school overall and the policies in my own classroom. Hello again, Ronnie. Um, you gave me a great idea with the report card thing because I know on my report card it does talk about having um, the students doing uh, digital projects and you know things that, of that nature. So um, that would be something that I could go to with my parents and you know my principal or the school district or whoever I need to talk to about. Um, putting a blog or something up. But yeah, that's that's a very great point. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question to this um, would also be, what are we as the teachers allowed to be posting about our students online? Um, you know, I think a lot of us see all the time um, people tweeting or, or blogging about their students and um, I'm all, I know for myself, I'm always very concerned about putting my students' faces online, but um, I don't really know what, what the laws are that are in place about this. So it would be um, great to know exactly what it is that we as the teachers are allowed to post about our students so that we can be sharing our experiences and ideas and, and resources um, with our students in the classroom. Okay, so here in this question where we're talking about what the teachers are doing, what the teachers are publishing, we get into here in the US, FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act or something like that. Um, and so FERPA basically, my understanding, has two main prongs that are relevant here. The first is the PII, the personally identifying information of the student. So anything that's of academic, um, directory information of the student, their name, um, what, what courses they're in, their schedule, their address, their social security number, I mean, all these things that are personally identifiable, unique to the students, those we shouldn't be sharing. In fact, there, there was a case uh, many years ago on EduBlogs where a teacher had a, a blog for her class and she was a special education teacher. And so she had the students publishing on her blog that made it very clear that those students that were publishing on her class blog were receiving services in special ed. Well, this, this is a, um, you know, part of the, the student's record. And so that did come into question, does this violate FERPA? You know, how, how do we handle this? Because we are identifying those students as, as special ed students publicly. So the, the way we got around that is we did the the blocking of search engines and, and then permission there for um, those students that were involved and, and making sure that there's no other identifying information. We weren't even using first names, overly cautious there in that case. Um, but but all these sorts of things you have to think about, are, are they part of um, the student's academic record? And it's really the second prong is still part of the academic record, but you can kind of think of it as separate, and that is grades. Anything that's like, you know, you think of the old-fashioned permanent record that follows the students around from year to year, you know, is what grades are they making, specific scores on assessments, 
uh, detailed feedback on assessments. All these things can be part of their, their academic record and will be protected under FERPA, so we shouldn't be sharing them publicly. Um, it's kind of debatable if you, if you Google this topic. Um, debated by the experts, does a photo count um, under FERPA? Some would say that a photo could be part of just simple directory information. Um, and so often at the beginning of the year in the student's handbook or something, it just says schools might share basic directory information with the public and um, giving the parents or students the opportunity to opt out of that. Um, so if they don't opt out, then you can you can feel like you can share things like photos and things like that. But these are um, really hard to give specific answers to because every single school might have their own unique policy around it and school district and, and those guidelines definitely need to be followed. So, um, but, you know, and some states have a kind of a, a, their own version of FERPA that might take a few things a little bit further and that sort of thing. So we just have to keep up with that based on where we are. Um, but, but, but I think that gives a, a good general answer of what you can and can't share. You can, you can leave comments on students' work. You can identify them by their first name. You can um, have them share work. You can share their work as long as it doesn't have the grade on it um, and that sort of thing. So, so there are definitely a lot more freedoms and, and people are becoming more and more comfortable with those freedoms. So I'm really interested in this question as well, the follow-up question. Um, Ronnie, I noted that you said sometimes in the beginning of the school year, a school will, you know, ask parents to sign off on whether it's okay to use their child's picture. Um, I know my school has that. Um, and I've looked at the, the policy paper, and it seems like it's very specific to being used for school purposes, like let's say, um, you know, their, their pictures might be used on the school's website. So parents can give permission for that or not. But I noticed a lot of teachers taking pictures of, you know, their classroom, maybe their students working in their classroom and posting on, you know, social media, um, such as Instagram. I, I follow uh, quite a few teachers on Instagram, and this is my personal Instagram account. And I don't post pictures of my students at all because I know we have a strict policy at my school. But I see, you know, teachers all over the country posting on, you know, Facebook or social media. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts on this are and are there any restrictions, um, you know, when it comes to this? Should students' pictures be allowed on teachers' personal um, social media, you know, sites? And, and so that's different from school use. So I'm wondering what your opinion on that is. Thanks. Thanks for that response, Ronnie. Um, you actually reminded me about the FERPA laws and um, that I need to keep myself updated on those. Um, I've heard of them, but I haven't ever really researched them and to make sure that I know exactly um, what they say just to make sure that I'm in compliance with those so thanks for that reminder um, and then I also agree with Farah's comments about um, seeing teachers post pictures of their kids all the time on their own personal social media so I'm also curious about what your thoughts are um, on that I'd like to tack on to Ashley's question. I've been researching this information about student identity and data in the digital world and have found that um, the companies are saying, or the people I speak to are saying, it's the re responsibility of the company to have the, those privacy laws in place. But I'm finding them very difficult to find and um, very hard to find the exact wording that says that they are compliant with the new California laws. So I'm wondering if there is um, a specific place I should be looking for companies that are meeting that information or meeting those requirements or if there's a place within a website where it should say that or who you contact. So um, that would be my addition to hers. Thank you. 
So in the in the last part of the question, we were talking about FERPA and the federal law. This this part of the question really is talking about SOPIPA, the I think the Student Online Personal Information Protection Act, uh, specifically, you know, passed in California. It's unique to California, and, and many other states are in the process of considering very similar legislation. Um, but, well, FERPA applies to schools, to school districts, to higher ed, to universities, and those folks that work in schools and, and higher ed educators, the administrators, and that sort of thing. So PIPA, on the other hand, applies specifically to vendors, the third parties, the ed tech companies, the folks like me. And my my understanding of SOPIPA is it, there's a few main points. Um, off the top of my head, we can't sell any student data. We can't engage in any targeted advertising. So if you visit our site or using our site, you can't see ads based on that on Facebook when you get there later. Um, we have to be very careful about the way that we store and protect student data. We have to um, respect any requests that we get to delete student data fully. Um, from parents, we have to be able to provide information on the types of data that we're collecting. And, and on that note, that's always kind of a, a gray area to me um, that I like to understand a little bit better is, you know, what constitutes student data. And, and in our case, we just assume that it's absolutely everything that that's done on our site, anything that we're collecting, anything that's done when students are logged in and all that sort of good stuff. So, you know, so PIPA was the first law, like I said, in the U.S. that, that really is geared towards ed tech companies, tech companies that are that are used in education in, in different ways and, and what we're doing with, with the student data. So your question really was, well, you know, as a teacher, how can you be sure that these ed tech companies are following this law? And it sounds like sometimes you approach those companies and you can't really get a straight answer. And the honest truth to this is that there, there's not a good way that I know of. So you know, like I said, this law is unique to California. Other states are in the process of passing similar laws. And in our case, with my company, uh, we work with countries all over the world who have their own laws as well. And so I, I can't, without extreme costs and overhead and legal fees and all this sorts of good stuff, have unique terms of service and, and unique certifications for every single state because then you also have cities that have laws and you have districts and all this stuff so you know where, where basically do we draw the line and, and i understand you know i'm i'm from texas live in texas and i think texas is a lot like california maybe florida new york where we we kind of think well if we pass these laws um or we set these standards you know other states are going to have to or companies are just going to have to meet them our states are bigger and, and and that sort of thing and i get it um, but at the same time, you know, I've looked into just just being honest uh, to third party audits of SOPIPA specifically, supposedly by nonprofit organizations that that are happy to dig into our books and dig into what we do and charge me many thousands of dollars to do so. And so on a product like EduBlogs, that's free, maybe forty dollars a year. You know, that doesn't make a lot of economic business sense. So all I can really do is I'll update my terms of service to in which we've done to include things like we're going to fully delete data if people ask. Things that we were already doing anyway, it just wasn't in our terms. But you as a teacher are not going to, I mean, you'll have to go through line by line all this legalese and, and make sure that it lines up and matches up. And that's not really fair to you um, to kind of put on your plate to be able to do. There are sites that are reviewing terms and then basically putting lists together. Like I said, many of them that we found are charging uh, too much for us to be able to participate in it. Um, if there are, there are cases where we have through our, some services that we do, where we have larger contracts with entire districts or things like that, then definitely we get the legal teams involved. We meet their uh, contract requirements, which will state something like meeting SOPIPA. So then it's not on the individual teacher's hands uh, to take care of, of what's going on. It's, it's more at the district level. And those, you know, we definitely um, take part in and, and get those types of requests all the time. Um, so the easiest thing, the thing that I'm seeing the most is kind of a standard form 
um, that highlights the law and asks if, if we meet those and that someone on our end signs it and returns it. Our company um, almost always is happy to sign those as long as it's something that we've seen before and can, and can readily verify. Um, you know, we'll, we're definitely happy to take a look. And it, it's just super hard and impossible to certify and verify every single local, state, federal law around the world for, for all of these services and products. So that's that's a huge complex issue that, that we're going to have to tackle. So as a teacher, what I would do as, as I'm verifying this, I would take a look at the terms and see if it mentions anything about any FERPA rules. It might mention SOPIPA directly. Um, look for some of those key areas to see that it, that they're mentioning it in the terms that they'll delete data, that they're not displaying ads or they're not using it, they're not reselling data. And, you're, and, and to me, you're doing your due diligence there. Um, it, it's, it's a shame, and this is a huge problem. I'm, I'm at South by Southwest EDU conference this week, um, which is one of the more industry-heavy conferences in the ed tech space. Um, you know, and there are dozens and dozens of startups here trying to make a name, trying to grow, trying to figure out how best they can serve educators and serve students with, with their services and their products. And this is a huge barrier to entry of trying to understand the landscape that's changing all the time and it varies from state to state and, and what it is that they have to do. And there's good reasons for these laws and why they're in place. Um, but for those guys like us that I feel like, you know, we've been playing by um, – playing by the rules for so long and, and we've been um, only always in, in the best interest of our students and the teachers that we serve. Um, you know, this is, just makes it a challenge because there are, have been cases where teachers tell us, well, we can't use you because we can't verify this particular rule is met in this particular place or something like that. Um, even though we know that it's there, it just would cost too much. And, and auditor, there's, you can look up these, uh, these auditors and certifications and things like that. And it just has to make good business sense to, to go down that road. Um, I'm kind of rambling on this topic because it is one that I feel passionate about on both sides, on the business side of protecting the interest of realizing folks mean well and are, and are doing well versus making it easy for the teacher and um, you know those folks in the schools that are making decisions to be able to have readily access to great new resources that are constantly coming down the pipe. So I hope I really answered your question, but I don't think I really did. There's just not a good answer. Thanks, Ronnie. It was my question. And, and yes, I think you did give me a lot of information to think about. Um, I especially liked how you pointed out um, what the vendors really have to be requiring and how I'm going to need to just look into the policies that the district has as well as those SOPIPA um, laws and that um, those those key areas to search for in the restrictions and the regulations. So I, th I think that you did give me a lot of information. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. I would like to chime in on this topic here. I have taught in higher education, so um, obviously a different environment. Certainly have to be aware of FERPA, but not so PIPA. Um, I've used a lot of different technologies over the years, and I think that um, one aspect of my experiences that does relate in some way to this conversation is dealing with accessibility concerns. In higher education, particularly working for a public university that receives federal funding, we have to ensure that our instructional materials are accessible to all students regardless of disability. This is tricky, um, particularly for people who aren't trained to understand how to navigate um, what it means it, about what, what it means to have a tool be accessible and content to be accessible. And um, I've found that um, when I start working with new tools, I have had to have a conversation with 
the representatives from those te those companies to ask them questions about accessibility. And oftentimes they're very unaware about what the, the requirements are for, for um, accessibility in teaching and learning. So it, it is really a partnership and a conversation. And I think that when I listen to Ronnie, I think that's um, something that I'm sensing is kind of a, a a need for us as educators as we identify tools that we think are uh, valuable to our students learning that we take it upon ourselves to have a conversation with those uh, representatives from those ed tech companies and ask questions about so pippa and verpa and um, you know there's contact information on every website and i think that reaching out and asking questions is a great place to start um, and Martha, I know that you want to see like a list and check marks <laughs> and hopefully we'll get there soon, but I just don't think we're there right now. Hi, Michelle. I, I had to laugh when you said that, um, I would be looking for a list of questions and, and so, um, that's exactly what I was doing. I was trying to find a list of specific questions and fortunately my chief technology officer at our district sent me the checklist that our district has um, to see if companies are compliant and she also sent me a copy of the writer that goes on to every contract um, so that's been really helpful because it does give me those specific questions I've also found the California Student Privacy Alliance which um, the County Office of Education is um, participating in and a member of and that gives me a list of the contracts that we have and their FERPA, uh, SOPIPA, and, and some other compliance that, um, that we have to have. So I found a whole bunch of stuff. I've also found um, an I Keep Safe, which is another site that's been helpful. So Ronnie's um, uh, points really brought out a lot of things that I hadn't um, considered. And then you also added to, you know, that thought about how hard it is to navigate um, the um, the reliability and the accessibility of, of information. So this has really been fantastic for me. So thank you so much. So question three is, how can a teacher get school administrators, IT departments, and parents to embrace blogs as a valuable educational tool? My class has just started looking at blogs this year, and I already can see that I would be very hesitant in some areas to have um, their personal information kind of, you know, out there. And I know my uh, IT department and my chief technology officer is very hesitant to release their blogs. So what do you think um, would be a good way to approach this information? Thank you. So, so definitely, I understand the fear um, of not being t totally confident and wanting to allow your students' work to be out there, um, both as a teacher and then also on the administrator side of things. I understand that it's opening up yourself for the potential for parents to not be happy with with work that they see or you're just might be afraid that a student might publish something that's embarrassing or maybe inappropriate I mean all these questions are legitimate and and there's no reason to avoid these questions um, so the, the number one piece of advice is as a teacher as an educator if you are interested in blogging then start blogging on your own um, just create a free blog somewhere and you don't have to publish it widely, you don't have to write all the time. Just start reading other teachers' blogs, educators' blogs, blogs in general that are out there, sharing your favorite things, any ideas that pop up. Your blog posts don't have to be really long. Some of the most popular blogs out there um, never publish more than a paragraph per post because um, they're just linking to, to some other tool. But I think that if you get into the habit of being involved in blogging, then all of those questions or, or fears or anxieties 
will basically be answered. You'll understand the benefits and see how those benefits will outweigh some of those those potential negatives. Um, and then if, if you are really interested in, in getting in, you know, changing the mind of some administrators or your IT folks in your district, you know, be ready to go to battle. Show, get some examples, some peers, um, some other, some blogs in your area, around the country, around the world that are, that are doing really cool things. Um, as I mentioned before, find in your state standards, the Common Core, the ISTE technology standards, all of these important, uh, you know, things that we're supposed to be doing with our students and find the pieces in there that do mention um, student publishing, students writing for authentic audiences, student um, writing in different media, students um, doing projects that include videos, photos, um, collaboration, all these things can be met through the tool or the instrument of a blog. Um, so all of, all of these things put together can, can really help start to make a case for why blogging is important. And I know that I, I'm representing EduBlogs here. It's not necessarily the blog itself that's important to me, um, but it is those things that I mentioned. There's no better tool that I know of that allows students to have an authentic audience, makes it easy for them to personalize their space. There are some great uh, e-portfolio tools. It can be very similar to blogging. A lot of folks are using blogs as e-portfolios, but um, you know, a lot of these e-portfolio tools that are out there, the students can't personalize. They may be able to change a color or a background, but they can't make it their own. When students have their own blog, they're choosing what it looks like. They're giving it a name. They're setting up widgets. They're adding personality to it. They're making it a digital representative of themselves and their learning. And so when they have that ownership of that space, um, they're much more engaged. They're much more um, likely to you know, be proud of the work that they're doing and, and, and just put in just a little bit extra into what it is that they're publishing on their space that represents themselves. Um, and so all of these things combined, I think you can start to build that case of, of why blogging is valuable in the classroom. Um, and then also to help make that case, show that you're choosing a tool that is safe, that has a reputation for you know, working well with students in the classroom that has content filtering, that has privacy settings, moderation settings, all of these different things that you might be looking for so that it's meeting the needs that you're able to keep those students safe. And then um, kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but um, to address some of those fears of your students, you know, not wanting them to share anything that they should, any personal information, but also any anything like that, you know, we, we talked about setting up those um, those kind of guidelines in the beginning. We have students as young as kindergarten, first grade, really, that are publishing on our platform that understand these are the types of things that I'm sharing. You're laying out uh, topics and prompts for the students that, that guide them into um, a situation where they're not just, you know, sharing um, things that potentially they, they may be not should be. Um, and the last thing I'll say about it is that students are publishing on the web, social media anyway, and we kind of have a, a responsibility as educators, as a society of helping train those students to have a, a good digital footprint, be good digital citizens, and um, to help them understand what all that means. And so if we're practicing it in the classroom for these learning experiences, we're teaching them what good comments look like. So maybe we can put it into comment trolls. We're teaching them what, um, you know, quality work looks like and, and, and writing for a specific audience looks like so that it's not writing always in a three or five paragraph essay or whatever it may be. So all of these, these things that I discussed really hopefully will help make the case. Um, case for blogging. Hi, Ronnie and Martha. Ronnie, I'm really glad you brought up that last point about um, the fact that students are out there using these tools now. And again, I think it's important for us as educators to be advocating to administrators um, that, you know, it's 
it's our job, it's our responsibility to ensure that students know how to do this in a safe manner and also know how to do this in a manner that is going to lead them to be productive, responsible, and successful global citizens in this um, mobile digital society of ours. So um, that's something that I think a lot about too. It's, it's, this is a conversation and we have to be putting forth our voices and advocating for why we think this is so important. Hello again. Um, I think another point to make too is that um, in co colleges and universities are moving towards using these types of um, apps and tools, you know, like blogs, Twitter, um, Canvas now with uh, CSUCI, uh, VoiceThread. So I think that we owe it to our students to prepare them for that type of education when, when and if they do decide to go to, uh, you know, colleges and universities. Um, so, you know, and along with everything else you said, I think, you know, going to whoever I need to, I think I feel more, um, I feel better about going to them and letting them know, hey, you know, we need to do these types of technologies because our students um, need it, especially in the area where I live, where most of my students, um, their parents don't have that type of technology, like laptops, and um, they don't have internet access. So, you know, I think it is very important for them, for us educators, to teach our students about technology. The fourth question is, what is our responsibility as educators for student blogs after the course slash year has ended? So what we really want to know here is once students leave our grade level or once they leave the school, what responsibility do we have for the blogs as well as any content that they publish, such as um, portfolios or email addresses. Once the you know course has ended, what is our responsibility? So, so it's really good that, that you're asking this question um, kind of at the beginning of blogging process. Because if you can share with students and with families you know, what the plan is for once this thing is over. Um, that really helps frame the usage of it during the time that, that the students are, are blogging. So my uh, opinion on the matter is whatever tool you choose to use with, with blogging, and this is beyond blogging, whatever tool you choose to use with absolutely anything related to the web or with students or even just in your personal life, um, you know, where you store videos, where you store your photos from your phones, where you store any content that you're creating is, is there a way to get that content out? Is data export ability? And there are lots of tools that are popular that do not make it easy to get the, the content out, to get the data out. Um, WordPress is a tool that is pretty good with, with getting content out and Edublogs is built on WordPress. So it also has the data exportability. So basically at the end of the year or when students leave the school or, or whatever it is, the students can export that content really easily and take it with them. They can import it into other tools. They can import it um, into wherever they go or they can just keep it. Um, you know, when we were in school, um, our parents may have collected boxes of some of our work and um, they might sit in a closet somewhere for a long, long time and collecting dust and you may, may look at them occasionally. Well, that's essentially what we're doing with students now is if their data is in the computer, we want to give them the opportunity to have the same thing. And actually this is a massive benefit of having the students um, write in a, in a digital way um, because we're assuming that the content that they're creating is 
something that they'll be able to access for years and years and years to come. And so I would say um, your first responsibility is to make sure that whatever tool you're using allows for data exportability because students are creating content, they have a right to that content and to keep that content. And then your second responsibility is to, I, I, I wouldn't I would so much as say it's a responsibility, but make it clear from the beginning that after a certain date, you're basically going to either delete the, the content, remove access, your access, to the content. So what's very popular on EduBlogs is um, teachers will be attached to student blogs while the students are in their course, but then when the students leave that course, um, the teachers basically remove themselves, but the students still maintain ownership of that blog, um, which is the way that I kind of like to see it. So at, when, when we work with entire schools or entire school districts, um, that's something that it does vary on the school or the district. Um, but many of the districts or the schools will, will keep that blog just kind of in an archived mode, most of the time on the web and accessible, but, but just keep it there um, forever, um, you know, or as long as the foreseeable future, um, which is really kind of the way I think it should be um, once they create the content. It, it should really be there that the purpose is that they're creating it for an authentic audience that will be long lasting and not just for a specific period for a specific course or a specific project. Um, so having those things kind of worked out ahead of time is, is the good way to go. And then just recognize that as a teacher, you don't need to be moderating those posts when the students are out of your class anymore. You can turn those, those blogs over to um, the students or in some cases I've seen where uh, the last thing I'll say on it is I've seen where teachers give the parents an opportunity to add themselves as the administrator of the blog so that the parents take over ownership and the teachers can remove themselves. So that's more in a situation where the blog is just um, affiliated with one teacher and, and it's not really expected that the student will keep that blog the next year. Hello again. So. I guess a question for um, you right now would be um, you're talking about having the school um, getting the blog. So um, how, are you saying like that the school goes to your company and buys or, or pays to have um, every teacher at that school have a blog and then like the students get imported or, you know, something like that, where is it sim? I guess what I'm asking, is it similar to like a Lexia program where um, it, it's a program that we have where students go on the computer and they do like um, language arts games that is that are supposed to help them with their um, reading comprehension and reading and stuff like that. Is that what um, is that similar to what you were talking about with uh, the edu blogs? Hi, Ronnie. Thanks for responding. Um, you gave um, me two really good ideas. The first one is to actually use something like EduBlogs, which, you know, allows educators to um, have access to their students' blogs um, for the time that they're in their classroom and then hands over control to them. Um, and I also really liked the idea of handing over control to parents. Um, I wish I'd kind of known this. Last year I started um, ePortfolios for my students using Weebly. And um, I didn't really, you know, look into it as thoroughly as I should have. And at the end of the year, you know, when my um, my subscription of just being able to have 40 kids under my name as a teacher expired, then I, I wasn't able to um, have the student accounts. And then their accounts also, you know, were, I guess, I guess, um, um, expired as well. So... Um, we we kept the content as much as we could. We kept files, but we couldn't exactly keep the entire website. 
So it was a little disappointing. Um, you know, after all that work, the kids didn't get to keep it. So they were disappointed. But I know what to do now for this year. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for your thoughts on this question, Ronnie. Um, I hadn't even thought about um, exporting the content or student content um, from anything that my kids have posted um, online this year. So um, I need to look into doing that for my students uh, for the end of the year. So in question five, what do you think is the future of social media, including blogs, e-portfolios, Twitter, etc., in education? And I think what we're trying really to um, discover is, is how much of this is going to be leading or changing to be more education focused. Um, I think right now for my fifth graders, Twitter is, is not in their realm. Um, I know they do it, but I don't see it as being an educational, as it as being an educational form yet. I think it's more right now as um, something they play with. So, what do you see as the future for these types of applications? Thank you. So, your previous question on what is your responsibility for when student blogs? you know, at the end of the year, what do you do with the student blogs, kind of set me up for this. I think a big part of the future, what we're seeing more and more of, is schools, school districts, some cases states, standardizing basically a way that we can use something like a blog or an e-portfolio or, so, or some tool where students can collect their work, share their work year after year, class after class, all in one place. So we work with, with some schools and some school districts where they've been customers of ours for many years, and students got their blog, they're using it as an e-portfolio in fourth grade, fifth grade, and now they're seniors in high school, they're getting ready to graduate, and they have years and years of their best work, their ideas, their projects, the things that they've made, all in one place. It's searchable, it's, you know... Uh, something that really represents their learning experience that they've had and, and all of the different things that they've done. Um, and so I see more and more of that, and I hope that the future is is only going to be better in that sense. Um, you know, that's kind of hard to achieve because there's always something newer and better coming out, um, but really sticking with it year after year is what's going to give the most benefit to the students in that in that practice, in that process. The, the other thing that I'll say about the future um, and, and where I think that the, the future of social media use and, and all this is going, you know, you mentioned blogs, you mentioned ePortfolios, you mentioned Twitter, all these different tools. And, and to me, the tool is not important at all, but the future really lies in more and more student-generated content, student-created um, content that they're sharing publicly and, and, and the collaborative part that comes with that. So it gets incorporated a lot in project-based instruction. It gets, um, you know, different ways of assessing beyond standardized assessments, all these sorts of things in the, in the, in the student-generated content space. You know, it could be videos, it could be voice threads, it could be um, blog posts, the big thing now and that we're going to see more and more of in the next couple of years is virtual reality, um, you know, where students are going to be creating virtual reality experiences um, based on, on the things that they're learning. And so here the students are able to synthesize all of the different things that, that are going on, the different topics, making relationships, putting it all together, spitting it back out in a way that's their own so that they're, they're owning that, that learning. And uh, I, I hope that the future of where we go is to be able to support that ease of students creating content, that ease of uh, teachers managing that content, and, and then also um, fitting in with uh, in the whole cycle, accountability cycle, the assessments that we're doing, the standards that we're, that we're developing, and all that's involved with that. <laughs> 